Okay, so here we are. We're at lecture number nine of the Haynes Method Hybrid Dry Needling Certification uh, course series. We're talking going to be dealing with the advanced elbow. Uh, we've completed a, um, uh, a lab one yesterday for some other uh, people who've been through lectures one through four uh, and so had a good uh, lab there. Uh, so uh, last week we uh, had the advanced shoulder, uh, or three weeks ago had advanced shoulder. Three weeks from now, we'll have the advanced wrist and hand. Uh, we're going to see a little bit of carryover between shoulder and elbow and elbow and hand, um, simply because the parts of the shoulder connect to the elbow, part of the elbow connect to the hand. Makes sense. So let's jump right in. We've got a good bit of content to go through. Uh, this evening, we're going to look at, again, of the, the upper arm. We're going to look at coracobrachialis, uh, biceps, brachialis, triceps, and brachioradialis, which is just a review from uh, last uh, session. Uh, but then we're going to get into uh, the specifics in the forearm flexors and the extensors, all of that musculature attaching uh, in and around the elbow. We'll go into each one of those in detail. Uh, then we'll go into our tendons and our ligaments, uh, ulnar collateral ligament, the radial collateral ligament, and the annular ligament, uh, the lateral and medial epicondyle, and then <clears throat> the olecranon bursa uh, for our uh, perineural protocols. As we get to the elbow, we find that we have a lot more uh, nerves that we're going to deal with. Uh, we'll look at the ulnar, the radial, and then some of the branches, the posterior anabrachial cutaneous nerve, the musculocutaneous, uh, lateral anabrachial cutaneous, axillary, medial brachial cutaneous, medial antebrachial cutaneous, and the anterior and posterior branch of the medial anabrachial cutaneous. <clears throat> that will take us on to our regional our diagnosis protocols. Again, as we looked at previously, uh, the uh, bicipital tendonitis, uh, uh, it would have been origin uh, for the shoulder. Here we'll look a little bit more uh, <coughs> at insertion, excuse me, at the, um, at the elbow itself. Then we'll look at some of the more common things we see clinically, which is our tennis elbow, our golfer's elbow, and then uh, uh, a cubital tongue where we get um, uh, paresthesias out in uh, the fourth and fifth digits. Um, one piece of, of supporting evidence uh, that I looked at uh, study uh, from uh, November uh, last year uh, from Navarro Santana. Uh, it was um, uh, the effects of trigger point dry needling on lateral epicondylalgia of musculoskeletal origin. They did a systematic review, a meta-analysis. Again, they're looking at uh, trigger points which if you've listened to the first eight lectures, you're aware that I don't focus on trigger points uh, primarily because of our inability to have reliability, uh, consistency with identifying these. I'm more interested in, in, in specific locations of needling inside each muscle or, or group. Anyway, this uh, study did um, look at the effect of dry needling either alone or combined with other treatment interventions. Um, looked at um, uh, disability, pressure, pain, sensitivity, and strength in people with lateral epicondylalgia of musculoskeletal origin. Uh, what they did find was a uh, reduction in pain intensity, uh, decreased uh, related disability, uh, increased pressure pain thresholds, uh, and uh, improved grip strength um, with, with the dry needling group. Uh, one thing they noted in their overall review was the most significant effect was at short term. Uh, so there was a positive effect of dry needling for pain, pain-related disability, uh, the pressure pain sensitivity and strength at short term in patients with lateral epicondylalgia of musculoskeletal or origin. So absolutely, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that short-term improvement in pain, inflammation of the area. As clinicians, it's then our, our, our goal, our objective uh, to provide that flexibility, that strengthening, that stage two, stage three uh, healing uh, to get our patients back to a functional status. Dry is never intended to be uh, a one-and-done uh, treatment um, with a, a, a problem that's been going on for a little bit of time, we're definitely going to see those other changes that have taken place. Again, clinically, let's knock that pain down. Dry needling plays a great role there. But then we have to do our, our, our due diligence afterward. We're restoring motion, restoring strength, and returning back to function. So we also want to make sure that we do take a look. Uh, it's less uh, relevant for the elbow, but going through the 3D kinetic screen 
uh, for cervical, thoracic, lumbar, shoulder, even including the elbow uh, and the hand, quite honestly, uh, can, can uh, uh, peel out some nuggets of, of good information. So I still would recommend going through that entire screen. Um, I'm not going to go through the entire screen as we have in previous lectures. Uh, when we get down to the hip, the knee, uh, the ankle and foot, they will come a lot more, more relevant, but definitely uh, you would want to take a look at that 3D kinetic screen that we've already looked at and see if you can see any movement dysfunction, any movement issues uh, that that screen would uh, play out that you might get a list of the change through dry needling. So moving on to our review of the upper arm, we're going to look corico, biceps, brachialis, triceps, and brachioradialis. Um, I'm going to, again, we're going to look at it through our uh, uh, 3D anatomy app, our complete anatomy, uh, going through our specifics of each of these structures. So let me get all the way down. Uh, I do include this for visual reference. If you need to go back and this is an easier way to review it, uh, fantastic. Uh, again, I've included um, that public domain information from Henry Gray, Gray's Anatomy of the Human Body uh, from 1918. Uh, it has been updated over, over time. Uh, so good information on that information, but let's jump into uh, our 3D anatomy here of the upper arm. All right, let's see here. And let me move that a little bit. All right, I maximized that. Uh, my moderator can let me know if I have a problem uh, seeing this here. Okay, so let me find uh, the, the upper arm. Again, this is everything that we've got to go through here. All right. So for the upper arm, again, we'll start uh, with, um, since it's closest to us, uh, the biceps itself, um, it's uh, insertion down in the radial tuberosity uh, and the antibrachial fascia as well. Uh, so uh, we have a, a very distal uh, insertion point uh, crossing the elbow joint, so definitely relevant. Uh, again, one of the, the, the few muscles that crosses two joints in the body, uh, the, uh, the long head, uh, if you recall from the shoulder, it, uh, or originating in the uh, glenoid, superior glenoid fossa, or the superior glenoid um, there at the superior labrum, and then the short head attaching on to uh, the uh, coracoid process. So let's hide that, get that out of our way, brings us to uh, coracobrachialis. Again, it is another one of the, the muscles that has its attachment uh, on the coracoid process. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, previous introductory um, lab, uh, we were needling uh, coracobrachialis at a distal location um, from a lateral to medial to get into that muscle down here. And the reason for that is we wanted to make sure uh, that we did not uh, have any direct involvement with the neurovascular structures that run um, right behind uh, the coracobrachialis and the short head. And so now we'll, we'll get to be a little bit more aggressive with our needling and we'll look at that uh, in just a bit. Um, so coracobrachialis there. Uh, we look, we've already removed the, uh, the biceps and it uh, lets us uh, see a brachialis sitting underneath. Again, it just crosses the one joint uh, at uh, its origin, uh, very close to the deltoid tubercle. If we had the deltoid still attached, you'd see that it, um, its attachment almost mirrors uh, the location there of the superior aspect of brachialis. Uh, it's insertion. So, um, a biceps itself onto the radius, uh, brachialis itself attaches onto the ulna. So uh, different functions of those muscles or different attachment sites uh, with a net same result of just flexion there of the elbow. Um, I'm gonna hide that and corico so that we can uh, ha have a better look at, at triceps. So triceps has, has the three different uh, heads, um, one actually onto uh, the scapula, uh, the other on the more proximal aspect of the humerus, and then we have the third. Uh, here, uh, its origin is the posterior surface of the humerus, 
it's inferior to the radial groove and it inserts into the leg or not. Uh, so if you recall with our lab for tricep, in order to make sure that we get a, get a needle through all three, we took a posterior approach, uh, <clears throat> bunched that muscle together, pulled it away from the body, and then needled directly through uh, to make sure we hit all three. Uh, clinically, uh, I might do it that way. I might come deeper into uh, this tenoosseous junction uh, through here, still get that same response. Uh, if I definitely know that I've got a, an issue more uh, with the medial versus the, the lateral head, uh, that I may try to isolate that bifurcation and needle into those themselves. I'm going to skip brachioradialis at the moment because we will get back to that when we get into the um, the, the, the forearm uh, extensors in, in just a moment. So that is our upper arm. Let me move back now to uh, our treatment. Again, I'm gonna run through these briefly. Uh, corico biceps, uh, the brachialis triceps, and the brachioradialis. We've already, already talked about the origin insertion innervation and the action. Um, okay, leave. Okay, sorry, I got a little pop-up on my, my computer there. Um, I'm going to check really quick. Um, okay, we are recording. Always want to make sure. Uh, so for coracobrachialis, we do have this, uh, again, this inferior approach. Uh, here, we're going to palpate for the deltoid tuberosity. We're going to graft just superior to the tuberosity uh, with fingers palpating for the brachial artery and the thumb at the tubercle. Then we're going to go two finger breadths superior to the tubercle, and we'll need a lateral to medial. Uh, patient needs to be here in the anatomical position for that muscle uh, to orient correctly to make sure that we needle into that. Um, when we, when, we're, when we go to finger breadth superior, uh, we'll be just anterior to the humerus until we feel the needle approximate the finger on the medial side. Uh, again, patient that has to remain in the uh, anatomical position. So that's for our original approach. Alternatively, the muscle can be needled directly into the coracoid process. So here, uh, I've illustrated that in green. Uh, as you can tell, there is a significant amount of neurovascular uh, bundle posterior uh, to uh, the coracobrachialis. Um, we'll also have the short head that sits uh, right, uh, just anterior to that. So um, we're gonna just drop, we can needle onto the coracoid process, or if we drop a half a finger breadth distal, uh, we can get a little bit better into that. <clears throat> and clinically, we do see some good improvement. Uh, we'll talk, uh, well, we, we did talk a little uh, in the advanced shoulder uh, about the bursa that sits uh, just posterior to that. So we're staying superior to that. One of the big cautions here is the cephalic vein. Uh, it is fairly prominent um, uh, between uh, pectoralis and uh, the anterior deltoid. Uh, so definitely want to try to avoid that uh, to avoid any significant bruising that might occur there. And so those are the two there. I'm going to jump. I still don't need to ask a poll. Let me get out of that and bring up a new share. All right, this is gonna be number two. So first we'll take that, that distal approach. We're gonna uh, grasp that muscle uh, in its omical position, and we're gonna go lateral to medial. And I'm using my, in this case, because of my position, I'm gonna use my thumb on the backside as my backdrop. That lets me make certain that I'm getting into that muscle uh, as I need to. Um, in a minute, we will come uh, proximal, uh, but again, distally, uh, we, we still get the good response without the risk to uh, that the neurovascular structures. Just right across. Okay, and then for the, the proximal approach, uh, again, palpate for that coracoid process. We're going to drop just maybe a half finger breadth distally, slightly lateral, and drop that needle uh, right there into coracobrachialis. Nice thing when we do the short head of the biceps, uh, we're going to be uh, in the same location there. Okay, let's get out of that. Let's come back. And now let's go back to a lot of jumping around here. Uh, where am I? Where am I? Here I am. That is not where I want to be. Ah, there we are. Okay, so uh, the biceps brachii. Again, we'll look at the short head of the long head. I don't spend a lot of time here. Again, the short head definitely can be needled um, more into the, uh, 
off of the coracoid. Uh, the long head can be needled if you follow uh, down the intertubercular groove. You can find that and needle into the, the other head. Uh, for our purposes, typically, clinically, I'll probably will needle directly into the muscle belly if I'm not concerned about a differentiating bicep from brachialis or the, the shorter long heads. Uh, for simplicity, if we do want to uh, diagnostically break those two out, then we can take that lateral approach. Uh, for that, uh, for brachialis, I mean, for bicep, uh, we'll grasp the, the bicep mid muscle belly, going to pull the, pull it away a little bit from the humerus and let us appreciate the difference between uh, bicep and brachialis. Uh, and then we're just going to need a lateral to medial uh, anterior to the humerus. And we're going to use the fingers on the other side as a backdrop to determine the appropriate depth. All right, come back for bicep. We'll take a look at it here. So again, I'm going to grasp that muscle belly. I'm going to pull it away slightly. Going to, going to need a lateral to medial. Uh, again, this is the approach that lets us differentiate between the bicep or the brachialis. Uh, show it here in, a, in, a, in an overhead view. Uh, clinically, if I'm not concerned about breaking those two muscles out, then I very well may needle from here down towards the mat. That way I needle through the bicep and through the brachialis at the same time. Um, <clears throat> less trauma for the patient, fewer needles inserted, and that's always, uh, that's always a good thing. All right. Um, speaking of which, we will move on to brachialis. Again, we see that sits a little bit uh, further distally with its origin um, inferior to the, the deltoid tubercle. Uh, here uh, we will um, we're gonna we're gonna grasp um, the, the, the bicep and we're gonna basically lift it and push it out of the way, push it more to midline, and then that'll uh, expose uh, the lateral portion of the brachialis. And we're just gonna needle into that brachialis almost from a uh, let's say we're gonna be from an anterior uh, lateral position. I'm sharing the folder. All right, I'm going to stop share, bear with me, share screen, and let me come to here. Okay, so brachialis. Um, yeah, sorry about that. Brachialis, again, we're going to lift the bicep up, push it medially so that it exposes the brachialis, and then we'll needle uh, from anterior uh, lateral to posterior medial uh, to land on the humerus as a backdrop to make sure that we can differentiate, again, brachialis from biceps. Uh, clinically, if we don't need to differentiate that, then we can needle uh, directly into um, bicep to get both at the same time. All right, so I'm gonna come back and let's look at video here. Hopefully I'll make this correct. All right, so for brachialis, again, you can see I'm gonna, I'm gonna grasp that bicep, I'm gonna pull it medially so that it'll, dip, it'll, it'll, it'll uncover brachialis. And I'm just gonna needle down to the humerus to isolate that. Get an upper, an overhead view, Can again, pull that bicep medially, exposes that ropey brachialis, and then I can needle right down into it right there. Again, not to be repetitive, but if it seems that what I need to do is to stay away from or I don't need to break out brachialis from bicep, then I can just do an anterior to posterior drag needle in uh, through bicep brachialis with the humerus as a backdrop. All right. So let's come back now. Um, let me get my share correct. Here we are. Okay. Um, and then the triceps. So I mentioned earlier that what I want to do is make sure that we catch um, all of the, the all three of the heads. We're going to catch uh, the lateral and the medial um, uh, together as one through the, uh, the the tendinous aspect of the muscle and the inferior uh, muscular component. At the same time, we'll get that that inferior at, uh, head um, uh, further uh, distally. So for that, uh, we're going to, similar to bicep, we're going to grasp the tricep um, proximal to the electron, just at the distal third of the forearm. We're going to pull it away or posterior uh, from the humerus. Uh, we'll palpate, again, be cautious of that medial neurovascular bundle. Uh, we want to go posterior to that uh, so we don't create any 
any uh, unneeded un uh, bruising, anything of that nature. Uh, here we'll need a lateral to medial uh, with a slight posterior bias again to avoid that neurovascular bundle. All right, so we're gonna jump to triceps, taking a look there. So again, I'm gonna grasp the triceps, I'm gonna pull it away or posterior from the humerus, and I'm gonna needle uh, lateral to medial with a slight posterior bias uh, to avoid that neurovascular bundle. We're back on track. All right. Um, okay, so we will get to the um, um, brachial radialis in just a moment. Uh, again, as the part of the extensor. Uh, so, but we're going to start on the flexor side. So here we want to look at each of the muscles of the forearm flexor. We'll look at first. Uh, like we did in introductory uh, lectures and the introductory lab, uh, we'll look at the common flexor group. Then we're going to look at the common flexor tendon and tenoosseous junction. Not only is it usually the muscle, but frequently if there is a grade one, grade two um, um, tear that we're dealing with, then we need to get into that, uh, into the tendon and even at the tenoosseous junction. May even need to find that we need to get onto the medial lateral, lateral epicondyle. Um, well, medial for flexor. Uh, and so we'll look at that when we get to tendons and ligaments. But then we'll move into pronator teres, the flexor carpi radialis, the palmaris longus, uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, flexor digitorum superficialis and profundus, flexor pollicis longus, and the pronator quadratus. All right, so in the common flexor group, um, here, the common flexor group itself, I mean, it's just comprised of all of the forearm uh, or the wrist flexor muscles originating at the elbow. So any of that medial side uh, tenderness, pain uh, that the uh, patient gets, uh, this is that common uh, flexor group. Uh, the, the tenoosseous junction itself, we're gonna look at uh, finding that medial epicondyle. In that, we're just gonna drop a finger breadth off of that to get into this uh, common uh, tendon and just a little bit further into the tenoosseous junction. There's not a large distinction between that. And really and truly, although this picture shows it to be very defined as it gets there, there's a lot more connective tissue that originates or that extends uh, further proximally onto the condylar ridge here. Uh, so uh, while we may needle onto this, if this is our point of pain, uh, we definitely may see that we need to move up further uh, or further distally uh, as well. Key determinant would be uh, which, which muscle groups are, are giving us the most uh, sensation uh, with palpation. Um, the, the, the muscles involved that make up the, the common flexor tendon, the tenoosseous junction, uh, it will be the pronator teres, uh, and honestly, to a little bit lesser degree uh, because it sits up a little bit more proximal. Uh, but further down, we have flexor carpi radialis, uh, the palmaris longus, and lastly, the flexor, the large flexor carpi ulnaris. Uh, for the pronator teres itself, um, and actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move into uh, our 3D anatomy application. Again, same speech here. Uh, good information to have here. I like to look at things in a three-dimensional approach to give us a better uh, view of, of how everything is moving. So that is there for your review. But let's come on down and get to the elbow wrist flexors. So get to the app, come back to the library. Uh, let's see. So we're going to look at, um, let's, I've actually broken this down into two pieces. One will be the, the, the deep flexors, and then uh, the other will be uh, the more superficial. Uh, so let's look at the deep first. So part of the deep flexors, and if I've got my, there we go. Let me close that. Okay, so number one, um, We'll look at, well, that's moved off out of the way. Let's get rid of that. And let me get rid of that. So flexor digitorum superficialis, uh, you can see um, uh, as it attaches on the distal aspect of the, uh, uh, the medial epicondyle, it comes down and it has a further attachment over onto the radius itself. Again, bicep comes down, attaches uh, here on the radius. Uh, and then it uh, continues further uh, into um, 
through the carpal tunnel uh, into the, the, the long finger flexors. Um, it's uh, innervation median nerve, obviously, uh, as that nerve travels down, which we'll get to momentarily. Um, and it, it, it's, it starts, uh, again, palmar aspects of the bodies of the middle phalanges of the index middle ring and uh, the little fingers. So onto the middle. Um, and we'll, we'll differentiate that uh, in a moment from, matter of fact, let me bring this out and let me hide that now so that we can see uh, flexor digitorum uh, profundus. Uh, again, it has a little, um, little further distal um, uh, origin and it's a, a smaller um, uh, muscle than superficialis. Um, here, the main difference again. Um, so this this one's interesting. It's uh, innervation. Medial part is actually the ulnar nerve, CAT1, with the lateral part being the anterior interosseous branch or part of the median nerve. Um, so here it inserts into the palmar aspects of the bases of the distal phalanges of the index, middle, ring, and little fingers. So here uh, it's it's flexing um, to differentiate. It's going to flex. As a matter of fact, let me get rid of that uh, synopium there so that we can see it extends all the way out. Uh, so the, the profundus is going to give us that full uh, finger grip, whereas we, with the uh, superficialis, it was more at the... Um, the proximal um, IP joint. Uh, so uh, that is profundus. Again, let me hide that. And we will take a look here at anything posterior. No. Okay. Uh, so here we'll look because it, uh, you know, it doesn't technically cross the elbow joint, but it's got a, 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 a it gets close and it has a function on a movement of the wrist. Um, flexor pollicis longus. Uh, here, its origin, the anterior surface of the radius uh, and into the uh, interosseous membrane, it starts into the palmar aspect of the base of uh, the distal phalanx of the thumb. The, the tenosynovium is in the way. Let's get rid of that so that we can see its insertion um, really distally. So um, that flexor really comes across uh, so we get that flexion extension uh, movement there. Um, it's again anterior anabrachial interosseous nerve uh, for its innervation, and then lastly the pronator quadratus. Um, again, because it has an impact on the motion uh, that happens there at the elbow, included in this muscle group, uh, equally it can be involved with uh, uh, when we talk about wrist and hand in a few weeks. But its origin, <clears throat> anterior aspect of distal one quarter of the ulna, it inserts in the anterior aspect of the distal one quarter of the radius, and then obviously it, it pronates. And again, anterior anterobrachial interosseous nerve. So that is our, 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 our deep. Uh, musculature. Let me come back to the library and let's find the superficial. Uh, let me move through here. Come on. Sorry, lots of slides to go through. All right, and let me bring my tools up and get rid of those tabs. There, move. Let me get rid of that. All right. So we're starting uh, pronator teres. Uh, again, when we're needling the common, uh, which we'll do, uh, the common uh, flexor group, uh, the, the pronator teres provides that, that midline, that medial border uh, to keep us out of that danger zone and, and the midpoint. Uh, so that is uh, the one that we identified there. Uh, <clears throat> origin, medial supraconical ridge of the humerus. Uh, and it inserts into the middle one third of the interlateral aspect of the radius. So that's where it really, where it really helps uh, get its power along with uh, the uh, pronator quadratus uh, to give us that pronation movement. Um, it's also one of the muscles that you can tell it has a bifurcated origin um, there on the medial aspect of the coronoid process of the ulna. Uh, so its origin actually crosses a joint line. So don't see that very often. Uh, innervated uh, by the median nerve. Uh, we'll hide that and get into uh, more. Let's get here. So <clears throat> here we have flexor carpi, radi flexor carpi radialis. Uh, again, on that um, 
medial upper condyle. We'll see whether we're going to march our way down here. Um, medial upper condyle humerus inserts into the palmar aspect base of the second and third metacarpal bones. So whenever we're trying to identify uh, that muscle, uh, we will use um, that to our advantage to, to, to identify that specific uh, muscle. We'll get a little flexion, uh, a little, little radial deviation uh, to identify that uh, as it attaches. And you can see uh, deeply there where it attaches on second and third. So we'll hide that, move on to, well, we've already done flexor dig. Let me eliminate what we've already done. Get rid of that, get rid of pronator quadratus and profundus. All right, that leaves us our lateral most muscles. So here we then will have uh, the palmaris longus. And so that one, its origin, the medial epicondyle, the humerus, uh, again, common flexor tendon, it inserts into the palmar aponeurosis and the flexor retinaculum. So whenever we try to identify that, that is that muscle as we wrist, uh, resist uh, wrist flexion, that that thing is going to pop up right there for us and, and make that easily identifiable. And most people, some people, it's not very prominent, but usually uh, that's uh, a nice landmark for us. Uh, we'll hide that and we'll move on finally to flexor carpi ulnaris. Here it's origin, medial epicondyle, the humerus, and the proximal two-thirds of the body of the ulna and the olecranon um, of the ulna. So when we get to uh, the ulnar nerve and the cubital tunnel, uh, we'll see that it plays a significant role as that nerve um, goes right through that small little passage. And so anytime there's a significant amount of Let's say there's neuromuscular tension in uh, FCU here. Uh, we can needle that and usually get a nice response. I don't have the nerve pulled up, uh, but I tell you what, let's let's throw that in there just so that you can see. Yeah, it has a very small window in there. Uh, there's, a, there's a ligament that uh, sits a little bit further, uh, Osborne's ligament, that's not actually on this uh, uh, anatomy app. Uh, surgically, that will be the thing that they uh, try to release as that nerve goes underneath that ligament uh, to give uh, uh, take pressure off of the ulnar nerve. Uh, anyway, it's uh, insertion, the pisiform bone, hook of the hamate, uh, the palmar aspect, the base of the fifth metacarpal. Uh, it is innervated by the ulnar nerve. And so as we come on down, we can see, well, there we go. That through its um, attachment there on the pisiform, it, uh, again, we can differentiate that by resisting our flexion and ulnar deviation. Uh, that way it's a lot easier for us to identify that. And we'll go through that momentarily with our, with our needling. And so those are basically the, the forearm flexors that we're going to, uh, to look at. Uh, so let me close that so there. Let's go back to a different share. Uh, let's go back here. Okay, so treatment. Let's look at our treatment for uh, all, all of these muscles um, for the flexor group. <clears throat> um, so we'll be, again, first time needling. Let's go supine. More commonly, we'll find that we're in a seated position. Uh, with the palm up, so we have access to that. But again, for purposes of patient safety, first time needling, uh, take them supine um, to, to get to that. Uh, here in this supinated position, we're going to palpate for the bicipital um, insertion into the radius. Uh, one thumb breath distal, um, we're going to insert the needle and advance it anterior to posterior medial direction, just away from midline at about a 45 degree angulation using our fingers to determine adequate depth. And so if I can do this correctly, all right, here's the common flexor, very good. Let me come back. All right, so again, we're gonna look at that medial group. It's bordered by pronator teres. And then we'll drop our needle about one thumb breath distal for that cubital crease. 
and we're going to go slightly lateral. And the reason we try to go lateral with that is one, we want to miss that midline neurovascular bundle, but two, with that lateral orientation down towards approximating the, the ulna itself, we're going to get through a bulk of the muscle tissue. Again, first line of treatment uh, for that medial group or lateral group for that matter is just to thread through all of those structures at the same time. Okay, let's come here. I'm going to pause. I'm going to share back. Where did we go? We're here. All right. So for the common flexor tendon, tenoosseous junction, uh, we're just going to move a little bit more proximally into uh, where that, that short tendon resides. Very common to, to have symptomatic uh, problems there. <clears throat> here, we'll palpate uh, the medial epicondyle. We're just going to drop one finger breadth distal. Uh, we're going to needle medial to lateral uh, to the ulna as the backdrop uh, using needle manipulation. Palpate that <clears throat> medial epicondyle. We're going to drop just a single finger breath as you drop off of that ledge and then just needle medial to lateral to land onto the ulna in, into that uh, normally fairly uh, sensitive tissue. Okay, let's bring here and we'll pause and come back. All right. So for the pronator teres, um, here, uh, we'll palpate the superior aspect of the medial epicondyle as well as possibly onto the ridge uh, that, that can have a little bit more proximal location. Uh, here, we're going to have uh, we're going to have our patient perform resisted pronation. We're going to try to uh, so we're going to tell them we're going to have you uh, try to turn your palm toward the table and we're going to resist that. When we do that, we should feel the pronator teres just pop up uh, above the common flexor tendon. Um, it comes in to meet the brachioradialis and it forms a cubital tunnel on the anterior elbow. We're going to be two finger breaths distal from the cubital crease. And we're going to needle in a medial to lateral direction, about 15 to 20 degrees. Again, palpation is the key to really identify that. So as you resist that uh, that 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 pronation, you'll you'll feel that uh, that 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 muscle pop right out. And so we'll move uh, number nine. Let's go to that. All right. So here we go. We're gonna palpate that medial border and then we're gonna resist. As we resist, that muscle is just gonna pop up into those fingers. You can identify that, drop down the appropriate distance and then drop in. Now, very, this will be very similar to our, our common flexor group. Biggest difference here, we're not, as, we're not as deep. We're not trying to thread through everything. We wanna isolate this. So when would I isolate all of these muscles uh, versus just thread through one, the common group? Well, if I've needled the common group a couple of times and I haven't got the response that I'm, I'm looking for, uh, odds are that there's there's one or two of those muscles that are giving me more of a problem. There may be some sort of a repetitive motion that they're doing. Um, maybe they're doing a, a flexing uh, uh, movement towards uh, pinky side. Uh, that'll tell me it's more of a flexor carpial nearest. Uh, maybe it's more uh, radial side uh, and a little bit further uh, into uh, the meat. That could tell me it's possibly a little bit more flexor carpi radialis. So we want to use our, 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 our muscle testing, if you will, to identify which muscle it is, especially after a couple of sessions that we just haven't got the response that we're looking for. So let's come back to our share. We'll look at flexor carpi radialis. Um, we've already talked about origin insertion. Uh, so to isolate flexor carpi radialis, we're going to radially deviate and flex the wrist while palpating medial to the pronator teres. So we know we just found a pro pronator teres by resisting uh, that pronation motion. Here we're going to have them radially deviate and then flex the wrist, and we're going to palpate medially to find um, the FCR. It's going to push out into your fingers as you uh, radially deviate as you flex and radially deviate. Uh, and so you'll be able to isolate it there. Uh, two to three finger breaths distal to the cubital crease. We're gonna needle through the muscle belly in a complete A to P direction. Okay, so we're gonna flex, we're gonna radially deviate. That's gonna let us bracket flexor carpi radialis. We're going to come that two to three finger breaths distal from the cubital crease. 
And again, anterior to posterior lets us isolate and target that specific muscle. I think we'll get here, we'll pause and let's come back. Um, again, very critical. Uh, if you want to isolate these, you have to go through and identify each of the muscles. Um, palmaris longus, uh, here, we're just going to flex the wrist. We're gonna not, not going to have any radial or ulnar deviation here. Uh, when we do that, we'll palpate medial uh, to the flexor carpi radialis, and the uh, palmaris longus it should push out at this point. Uh, if we're uncertain, we can follow that tendon all the way down to the distal wrist and then follow it all the way back up. But if we eliminate the radial or ulnar deviation, that should help us isolate palmaris longus. Again, two to three finger breadths distal from the cubital crease. Uh, we're gonna needle um, um, in a medial to lateral or toward midline uh, with the ulna as a potential backdrop. So again, no ulnar, no radial deviation. I'm palpating for the tendon at the distal wrist and I'm trying to locate the, the more tightness, the more contracted muscle belly, they're more in midline. And so again, here, anterior to posterior, uh, because of the patient's position, it, 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 we're, we're really trying to go a little bit more lateral uh, towards the ulna as, as our backdrop. Um, our neurovascular bundle gets really small uh, here, so I get less concerned. Uh, matter of fact, in a little bit, we're going to do some uh, perineural, look at the perineural dry needling, in which case we're trying to get very close to those uh, nerves and the, and the vascular structure. So um, there are areas we do get very concerned about it. Here, I'm more interested in making sure that we ad identify the muscle we're targeting, and then we can drop that needle directly into that muscle. All right. So then we'll get the flexor carpi ulnaris. Uh, and if you had to take a guess, uh, guess the way we're going to identify this is we're going to flex and ulnarly deviate. Um, so we're going to flex the wrist um, um, without ulnar deviation at this point. Uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, we are going to ulnarly deviate. So that, that's a, uh, a misprint. Uh, we're going to ulnarly deviate to locate that. Um, there we're going to come down about three to four uh, finger breaths uh, from uh, distal to the medial epicondyle. And here we're going to needle in a medial to lateral <clears throat> toward midline uh, with the ulna as a potential backdrop. That way we get through the bulk of uh, FCU as we're moving there. If we try to go too superficial, then we may not get enough of that, that muscle. So again, this one we're going to go lateral to medial towards that midline. So again, definitely we're going to flex, ulnarly deviate, so we can isolate that. Uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, rather large muscle, uh, so it should be fairly uh, easy to isolate. Um, I'm looking at the video. I'm not certain if my subject relaxed their muscle before I needled. Uh, definitely, once you isolate that muscle, you bracket that thing like we were doing right here, go ahead and have them relax. Uh, you never really want to needle into a contracted muscle that uh, can be less than uh, enjoy. And joyful. So uh, flexor carpi ulnaris. All right. Uh, so we'll move next. Let me rewind that a little bit. Uh, FDS, let me change back again. So we're getting to the deeper, um, deeper muscles, uh, flexor digitorum superficialis. Here we're going to place our palpating fingers between the bellies of flexor carpi radialis and palmaris longus. Uh, so we just went through uh, how to locate that. So with that, we're going to resist wrist flexion, and we're going to go from, um, from radially deviating to being neutral to locate the space in between those two muscles. So if you have to find each of them again, uh, locate those and then find uh, the midpoint. So on this one, uh, between the two bellies at the midpoint of the forearm, uh, just halfway between rest and elbow. Uh, we're going to needle anterior posterior direction and there's no backdrop. So again, we're going to resist to find that. So with that, so we've, we've, I'm going to pause that right there. We've identified the, 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 the space in between flexor carpi radialis and, um, 
I'm drawing a blank. Um, not pronated, palmaris longus. And then we're going to resist finger flexion at the proximal IP joint. And that's going to let us really delineate uh, flexor digitorum superficialis. Uh, in a bit, we will flex just at the IP joint, and that'll give us profundness. But here, we, we want to be specific uh, that we're getting into the, the bulk of what we're looking for for superficialis. Locate that. We're going to drop it deep, uh, right midline, anterior to posterior. Right. Let's come back. Uh, look at profundus. Again, we see that it sits a little bit further, a uh, little further distally on this. We're going to place our palpating fingers on the belly, flexor carpi radialis, and we're going to have our patient inflex and extend the fingers at both the PIP and the DIP joint. Um, at about four finger breadths distal from the cubital crease, we're going to needle in the anterior posterior direction uh, with the ulna used as a backdrop. It is a D muscle, and we must pass through flexor carpi radialis and flexor digitorum superficialis before you actually reach um, flexor digitorum profundus. So we've got to use a little bit longer uh, needle here, say three to four centimeters. If you've got a really large, a bulky uh, forearm, then it may even take a little bit more than that. Uh, so flexor digitorum profundus, let's come back and let's look at that. So again, we're coming down and we're locating. Uh, needle location is going to be about four finger breadths, going to drop down. And again, it's going to be anterior to posterior. Probably needs a little bit more depth, again, to reach through those other muscles to get down to the depth of flexor digitorum profundus. Okay, let's move into flexor pollicis longus. We're going to be moving further uh, down the forearm a little bit. Here, we're going to palpate flexor pollicis longus by place um, the place to palpate it. We're going to place our palpating fingers on the volar radial aspect and the distal half of the forearm. Uh, we're going to isolate the muscle by resisting IP thumb flexion and IP thumb flexion. I don't know if you can see. Uh, we'll talk about um, the thumb motions in a moment. We have flexion and we have extension. And so we're going to resist and we're going to palpate that um, up there at on the radial aspect in the distal half of the forearm. And so let's, uh, and we will use the radius as a backdrop. So let's come down to uh, flexor pollicis longus. So radial side. Again, we're looking at uh, resisting thumb flexion. Can be a little bit more challenging to locate at times. Okay, not the best needle placement on my part. That's a little bit more on the ulnar side than the uh, um, radial side. Um, we will have, we do have another muscle that we'll get over there a little bit further. Uh, so let me come back now to pronator, pronator quadratus. Here, we're going to palpate uh, pronator quadratus uh, by place uh, to place, by placing the fingers in the volar radial aspect, three finger breadths proximal from the carpal crease. Uh, so we have proximal and a distal uh, carpal crease. And so what we want to do is, is come three finger bets proximal, and then we're going to resist pronation. Uh, so here we're going to needle at that location on the radial side uh, from anterior to posterior with a medial aspect of the radius as the backdrop. Okay, good. coming up a few finger breaths. Palpating for that right there. Really and truly, this can be done either ulnar side or radial side since the muscle does go to either side. All right. Uh, pause the forearm extension. So that takes us through all of our 
forearm flexors. Now we'll move on to the forearm extensors. Again, here we'll look at um, what we had done before with our common extensor group. Then we'll look at the common extensor tendon, tendon osseous junction, and then we'll go through all of the muscles there on the extensor side. So the common extensor group, again, comprised of all those forearm wrist extensor muscles originating at the elbow. Uh, for the common tendon, extensor tendon, uh, it's the extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor digitorum, extensor carpi ulnaris, and the anconius that create the bulk of that muscle tendon and the tenoosseous junction. Uh, brachioradialis, what we can do is we've al already discussed this. I will let you review that. And I'm gonna go down and do take a little time to look at um, the 3D anatomy piece. All right, so let's share again. Let's see if I've got the right one. All right, so let's see here. We have some extensors. Again, we'll look at our deep structures first. And let me get rid of these labels that are doing something weird. Okay, all right. So our, our deep structures, number one, supinator. Uh, the supinator, and I'm gonna really dial in here, um, similar to we saw on pronator teres, uh, the supinator also has a bifurcated uh, origin, one on the lateral epicondyle and the other on uh, the supinator fossa of the ulna. It's also going to wrap around um, onto um, the radius. Uh, and again, here's, here's bicep tendon coming down to attach uh, right here. Uh, innervated by posterior antibrachial interosseous nerve, 667. And again, it's action, supinating the forearm. Okay, we'll come up. I'm going to get rid of that. Let's move that out of the way. And now let's get into some of the, uh, the thumb muscles, uh, thumb and extensor indices. So we'll look first um, at abductor pollicis longus. We looked at flexor pollicis longus uh, earlier here. The abductor, um, its origin, the posterior aspects of the proximal half of the ulna, middle one third of the radius. Again, another muscle that has uh, an interesting origin, uh, having uh, attachment on both radius and ulna. Um, it inserts the lateral aspect, the base of the first metacarpal. And that is what gives its ability to abduct, uh, abduction in the thumb uh, is out to the side, or flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, abduction. Ab abduction, adduction. So this is where we get our, our power from this lateral pull uh, of that muscle. So let's hide that. Uh, let's go ahead and look here at the extensor uh, pollicis longus. Again, we had our, our flexor and then our extensor. And so its, it's location really helps with that motion. Um, <clears throat> origin of the posterior surface, the middle one third of the ulna and the adjacent interosseous membrane of the forearm. It's been removed so that we don't have to see that there, but it has an insertion there or an origin there. It inserts in the dorsal aspect and base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. And so similar to the abductor, uh, those two muscles provide a, a really nice uh, movement there. Uh, again, innervation, posterior antibrachial, interosseous nerve. Uh, so let's hide that and let's move into, lastly here, the extensor pollicis brevis. Uh, so here, uh, origin is the posterior. Let me get that back where we can see a little bit better. Uh, the posterior aspect, uh, the distal half the radius, and again, that interosseous membrane is, has been removed for our purposes here, but it, that it also attaches there. Uh, and it's searching the dorsal aspect of the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb, giving us that, that extension movement coming back. And we'll look at that again in a moment. Um, again, it extends the thumb, 
Again, posterior anabrachial, interosseous, C7, C8. And lastly, the extensor indices. Uh, it comes off um, just the one third of the ulna uh, and also the adjacent interosseous membrane. Uh, and it's, it inserts into the extensor expansion of the index finger. Uh, so um, extensor digitorum, we'll look at in a little bit, um, controls the remainder. Uh, extensor indices has its own. Um, innervated posterior anabrachial interosseous nerve. So those are the deep uh, muscles. Let's come back to the library and let's find the superficial. Kill that and let me bring it up here. Okay. So here is a nice little rotation of, of muscles uh, that um, frequently whenever we're doing, dealing with uh, lateral epicondylitis, tennis elbow, we will find that you may have four, five, six needles all in a row in each of these muscles. Again, our first is always going to be to needle through them as a unit. We're just going to thread to that common extensor group. Uh, but let's look at each one of these, uh, brachioradialis. Again, its origin on the supracondylar ridge. Uh, it inserts in the lateral aspect of the distal part of the radius. And so um, it doesn't have an, uh, a piece that does that moves past that. So its action is actually simply flexing the forearm at the elbow joint. And we frequently like to think that we flex that thumb, it'll give us a little bit more motion uh, up here in the muscle itself, but it really is just an elbow flexor. Uh, we move further. Uh, I'll go ahead and hide that. Um, so there, then we'll get into extensor carpi radialis longus. Uh, longus and brevis are very similar. Uh, longus, again, is going to be distal to brachioradialis along that supracondylar ridge. Um, longus and brevis uh, will travel down. Longus is going to attach at the base of the second phalanx, and the brevis is going to be at the third. Um, innervated by the radial nerve. Uh, again, they extend the hand at the radiocarpal joint, and they can abduct the hand at the radiocarpal and the midcarpal joints. Uh, and we'll go through, whenever we go over the kneeling in a moment, uh, how to kill those two away, out away from the others. So yeah, that, then we'll get to extensor digitorum. It will highlight for me. All right, extensor digitorum. Again, its origin is off of that lateral epicondyle. And then here we do see as it comes out um, to uh, through, through the different uh, volar uh, pulleys uh, on the, uh, or the dorsal pulleys on the, on the wrist and the hand uh, to the extent out to extend those fingers. Uh, interestingly, um, we see that um, extensor indices, so this only extends the here extensor indices will carry that the rest of the way out to the end of the index finger. And they are for obviously extending the fingers. And so we'll hide that and get to the last extensor carpi ulnaris. Here again, origin, lateral epicondyle that it inserts in the medial aspect of the base of the fifth metacarpal bone. So that's what lets us resist um, our ulnar deviation and extension uh, to isolate that muscle. Uh, innervation here, posterior anabrachial interosseous nerve. All right, so let's move into back here. All right, the treatment part, common extensor group. Again, we covered this a little bit um, in the introductory lab. Uh, but let's go through this again, again, initial treatment, supine position. Um, after that, I'm probably going to have them in a seated position uh, so that I can get to, again, here, palm will probably be in a seated position, palm will be uh, laying on the table or on the pillow in front. It uh, gives us good access to that, 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 that lateral compartment. But in the supine position, we're going to palpate for the bicipital insertion into the radius. Uh, we're going to grasp the muscle belly, the extensor group, and then one finger breadth distal to the biceps will insert a needle, advancing it again, anterior to posterior lateral direction, away from that midline uh, at about a 45 degree angulation. And we're going to use uh, fingers to determine adequate depth. So, common form extensor. 
So we're going to find this. Uh, here we're going to look for brachioradialis on, on this lateral aspect, whereas medial, this pronator teres. Again, in this position, we're going to thread through that, that common group. We want to, in this case, uh, try to let that needle fall just lateral to the radius. That way we make sure we get as much of that muscle bulk included in that. And again, this is our, our first line treatment for <clears throat> our, our lateral epicondylitis, our, our tennis elbow. Uh, more often than not, that's as far as we have to go with that. We'll look again at the the common extensor tendon. Again, here uh, we'll palpate the common extensor tendon at the radial humeral joint line, and then we'll drop two finger breaths um, approximately onto the lateral epicondyle. Um, so we, we will, so two different things. One, we want to do it distally where we at that joint line. I don't have a red dot there, but we want to do it both there and then more up onto the lateral epicondyle itself. We're going to need a little bit of both for that. Again, it doesn't show, but there's a lot of connective tissue that comes up and tends to be inflamed as it's moving up that, that conduit ridge. Uh, less often we see that, that inflammation in brachioradialis at its insertion, but we can't see it further distally in the muscle belly itself. Uh, so just getting onto that common extensor tendon, tenoosseous junction, um, very frequently uh, necessary uh, dealing with, with that piece. Uh, we'll share, get down to video of that. Oh, already missed it. Let's go back. All right, common extensor tendon. Again, I'm gonna find that joint line. And then I'm going to needle onto the lateral epicondyle, but I'm also going to drop down again. I don't show it here onto into that muscle just a little bit dis, more distally right about here. Uh, very frequently to have that, that pain, that sensory uh, issue there at the epicondyle. But let's drop into that, uh, that tendon itself, uh, just a finger breath or two uh, further distal. All right, and then we'll get to brachioradialis. Let me come back. So here we're going to resist uh, bringing that thumb towards the shoulder. Again, really what we're looking for is elbow flexion. Brachioradialis doesn't extend past uh, the radius. So that's, again, we tell our patients to do that, but just that resistant flexion is all we have to do. That's with a thumb oriented uh, superiorly. Uh, so we've identified bracket that muscle. And then about three finger bets distal from the cubital crease, and we'll needle directed towards the radius. So resist that elbow flexion. Got to let brachioradius pop, pop, pop out. We can bracket that and then needle directly down to the radius. Again, I'm in this position just for filming purposes so that you don't have to look at my back. Um, as we take an overhead view, again, resist. Brachioradialis pops out. I can bracket that thing right there and then drop my needle. Three finger breaths from the cubital crease down to the radius as our backdrop. All right, pause that. All right, so now we'll look at extensor carpi radialis longus. Here we're gonna have the patient dorsally extend the wrist and then pull towards them or radially deviate to activate ECRL. We're gonna bracket that muscle belly, again, three finger breaths distal to the cubital crease and needle directed toward the radius. Again, our, palp, our, our muscle testing is, is keen and, and, and absolutely necessary in order to find the, these muscles. Um, so um, wrist extension and radial deviation to activate ECRL. So we're gonna extend, radially deviate, it's gonna pop out. As you palpate across that muscle with it activated, absolutely able to, to find that. Three finger breaths from the cubital crease, identify it, bracket it, have them relax, and advance your needle. It's all about locating um, the, the pertinent muscles here. Okay, we're gonna keep moving down the row, extensor carpi radialis brevis. So here, similar, we're gonna have the patient dorsally extend the rest, pull, to work, pour, pull towards them, again, radially deviating to activate ECRB. It's gonna pop out a little bit more distally down the forearm. So here we're gonna drop about four finger breaths. Um, 
going to be a little bit more difficult to separate ECRL, ECRB. Um, but the distance and being a little bit further lateral will give us a little bit more uh, closer approximation uh, for ECRB. So again, they're going to extend, radially deviate, going to come down a little bit further. There we go. And that'll help ECRB pop out just a little bit further. So we're going to drop down about four finger breadths needle down to the radius is our backdrop. And that'll give us ECRB. Okay. For extensor digitorum. Here we will look at, uh, so we're going to have the patient lay their fingers on the abdomen and we're going to have them slowly just play the piano. So they're just going to wiggle their fingers up and down. And in the, in the middle uh, of the forearm, we're going to feel that muscle uh, as it rotates underneath our fingers. Uh, here we're going to about three to four finger breaths distal to the radial head. Uh, we're going to bracket that muscle and then we're going to needle directed towards the ulna. So we're going to have to take a little bit different direction in order to get through that muscle um, with a now moving more towards the ulna to get uh, as our backdrop. All right, so I'm going to palpate three to four finger breaths down. I'm having her, you can't see, but I'm having her play the piano and I can feel that muscle just rotating. So here, I'm now going to start moving a little bit more towards the ulna as, as our backdrop. Extensor ditch. Extensor carpi ulnaris. Here, we're going to have the patient uh, extend the wrist again. Then we're going to have them ulnarly deviate. Uh, here we may have to uh, have some, there may be some overlap with uh, the, the EDC, extensor digitorum. Uh, you can follow the extensor carpi ulnaris all the way down to the wrist. Um, three to four finger breaths distal to the radial neck. Uh, we'll, we'll bracket that muscle and then we'll needle directed down towards the ulna. You know, can't see the hand, but we're, we're resisting um, extension and ulnar deviation. And that muscle is just going to pop out right there. Again, extensor carpi ulnaris, fairly large muscle, and we can get a lot of purchase right there for, for kneeling uh, down towards the ulna. Um, lastly, we'll look at the anconius. Um, clinically, not that involved that often. I can say that I have seen it uh, on more than several occasions that Anconius is involved. Uh, so definitely we want to be able to, to needle that. Uh, you can tell it's a very small um, muscle, uh, but we want to be able to, to isolate that. Here we're going to palpate two finger breaths distal and one finger breadth lateral to the olecranon process. We're going to resist elbow extension to isolate the anconius. So you really have to get into some, some challenging extension, extension in order to have that muscle activate. Uh, and it, it's similar to the lock home mechanism of uh, the vastus medialis in the knee that serves that same function. And so it may not fully appreciate its contraction until you get to that last little bit of, of movement. Um, at that point, we're going to bracket the muscle belly two finger breaths distal to the apex of the olecranon and we'll needle directed towards the humeroradial joint. All right. So here I'm actually resisting her extension, letting that anconius uh, pop out right there. We're gonna needle across it towards the humeroradial joint. All right, supinator, uh, getting to the deep stuff now. Uh, here, so for supinator, uh, a little bit more challenging to palpate, but uh, we're going to palpate for the margin between extensor carpi ulnaris and extensor digitorum. We're going to resist uh, supination to feel contraction of the supinator. Uh, we'll bracket the muscle belly approximately three to four finger breaths distal to the radial neck, and then we'll needle directed toward the ulna. So again, we're going to use other identifying other muscles to identify the supinator. 
once we have identified that three to four finger breaths, and then we'll be able to needle uh, again towards the ulna. Was that Conius? Let's move to the next. All right, so I'm identifying extensor carpi ulnaris, extensor digitorum, three to four finger breaths distal now. I'm going to resist supination and I'm going to draw the needle in there down towards the ulna. Again, just specifically to target that. For abductor pollicis longus, let's come back. Here, we're going to bisect the arm, uh, the forearm in half. At the midpoint of the upper half, we're going to palpate the dorsal surface closer to the ulnar border. Uh, and you're going to do that while you have the patient abduct the thumb to, add, to isolate abductor pollicis longus. When you can appreciate that muscle, you're going to uh, bracket it, and then you're going to needle down toward the ulna. Well, I went too far. Here we go. So we're going to palpate. I'm having her abduct. Got a needle midpoint down towards the ulna. Extensor pollicis brevis. Uh, here, uh, three to four finger breaths proximal to the distal radius on the dorsal surface. We're going to palpate for an EPB uh, as they abduct the thumb. We're going to palpate the muscle belly, and then we're going to needle directed now towards the radius. Now that's ulnar side, come over to the radial side. Unless I showed you the wrong video. So for, for abductor uh, pollicis longus, ignore that location, it's gonna be more radial side. We may get that with a, with a 45 degree angle, but it's gonna be more on this side. Um, with 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 that talking about needling of the uh, more more distal muscles in the wrist and the hand, uh, where I find our our biggest use of this needling is especially in our uh, hemiplegic patients, patients with elevated tone in the hands and the fingers. Uh, say they've got a, a flexor tone going on. Uh, you can hit that flexor compartment, and you do get a nice release of that muscle tension if they've got significant issues related to contracture or potential contracture. Using that needling to decrease that can then let you have that ability to work a little bit more on range of motion um, in, in that regard. Uh, talking to a, a clinician uh, here recently, it doesn't change what's happening in the brain, which is responsible for that, that tone in the first place. Uh, but it does give us the advantage of getting ahead of that that forced contraction of those muscles. And so that's one of the areas that I've seen, especially this, this proximal wrist um, flexors and extensors where we can see our greatest improvement is in our hemiplegic population. Okay, we'll get extensor pollicis brevis. Oh, so that's why it's backward. I, I did it backwards. So now we'll move to extensor pollicis longus. So in this regard, I'll, I'll correct this. In this regard, uh, the, the verbiage here is what's correct. Um, so for extensor pollicis longus, uh, one palm breath proximal to the distal ulna on the dorsal surface will palpate for EPL as the patient abducts the thumb. We're going to bracket the muscle belly and needle directed towards the ulna. All right, so extensor pollicis brevis. Yeah, so this video, extensor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis early are switched.
So I'll correct that before we uh, submit this up online for uh, to be viewed later. Again, look at the verbiage in the, the PowerPoint. That is the correct verbiage. All right. And let me share again. Finally, extensor indices at three to four finger breadths proximal to the ulnar styloid process uh, on the dorsal surface will palpate for the extensor indices as the patient extends the index finger. Uh, we're going to bracket that muscle and needle directed toward the ulna. So we're, we're extending, we're not abducting. When I was talking to the patient with audio, I said to extend. And I told him to abduct, not to extend. You know, directed towards the element. And if you palpate on yourself, as you extend that extensor indices, you can feel it there on their side as it crosses uh, radius over to the ulna. All right, now we're gonna move on. So that, that's the musculature of the, the, the elbow, the forearm extensors, flexors. Flexors, let's move into the tendons and ligaments. All right, hit the library. <coughs> All right, where are we? All right. <clears throat> well, all right, let me turn those off again. Okay, so in the elbow, uh, what we get concerned about are a few things. One, it's not a tendon, it's not a ligament, but definitely the lateral epicondyle because there is a lot of of connective tissue that connects uh, that common extensor tendon uh, to this area, we do seem to find that that similar to our pain that we get in our PSIS, we find a lot of the pain right there on uh, the, the lateral epicondyle. Same thing for the medial epicondyle. We have to be a little bit more cautious on the medial side. We do have a little bit more of our neurovascular bundle that's that's crossing through this area. So our palpation can be a little bit more tender here. Um, on the radial side, the ligaments of concern, uh, well, since we're here, the lecranon bursa. Uh, it's, it's not that common, but somebody that does have uh, an inflammation of this olecranon bursa, it can be a significant issue. Yes, we can needle into that, promote some healing, uh, get that under control, and we'll go over how to do that momentarily. Uh, then we'll look at the radial annular ligament or the annular ligament of the radius. Uh, it extends all the way around, coming off of the ulna, all the way around and attaching back onto the ulna. So just acting as a sling, if you will, to hold the radius in its place. There's also the, the radial collateral ligament. So if I, let's fade that. We'll look at the radial collateral ligament. Um, it does attach on to the lateral epicondyle, uh, but then it has a, a communication that uh, connects to the olecranon on itself. And then all the way around, and it's buried deep here, but will come all the way around uh, and attach on the other side of the radius. So uh, the radial head has a lot of support to hold it in place. We look more on the medial aspect, and then we get into the ulnar collateral ligament. Um, three different heads of the ulnar collateral ligament. Uh, again, the ulnar collateral ligament has to be fairly strong as well. Our pitchers tend to, are, are hard, especially curveball pitchers, sidearm, uh, tend to have more uh, incidents of injury here uh, at the ulnar collateral ligament. Um, issue there, as long as it's not a grade three, a grade one, a grade two uh, sprain, absolutely we can needle into that. Um, we will momentarily look at... Um, 
combination of needling there, uh, as well as uh, uh, extensor carpi ulnaris, I mean, flexor carpi ulnaris and the, uh, uh, the ulnar nerve as well. Uh, so those are basically the structures that we look for in the elbow. Uh, we can go into the capsular region. Uh, it's rarely going to be that significant unless there's some, uh, say there's some uh, capsular um, tightness that we want to needle that capsule to, to get some more range out of that elbow. Uh, but for the most part, uh, the ligaments and that olecranon bursa are our, our big areas of concern. All right, so for the ulnar collateral ligament, um, again, it's a stabilizer. Uh, let's move here. So the treatment approach for this um, patient is going to be supine. Uh, the shoulder is not going to be abducted 300, but it's going to be abducted 30 degrees. Uh, the forearm will be supinated and resting on a pillow. Just give us access to that medial aspect. Uh, our back knee length here, it's very superficial. It's just going to be about 1.5 centimeters. Uh, our backdrop is going to be the lateral surface of the trochlea. And so here we're going to palpate the distal or inferior aspect of the medial epicondyle. We're going to drop one finger breadth distally to palpate the thicker anterior bands of the ulnar collateral ligament. We're going to needle medially to laterally or toward midline uh, with the lateral trochlear surface as a backdrop. Important here to not needle posteriorly in the area of the ulnar nerve. So that ulnar nerve is going to sit a little bit more posterior, and we want to make sure that we're not uh, going too far back in that, especially if we're just wanting to target the ulnar collateral ligament. All right, so here ulnar collateral ligament, uh, arm is abducted. We've palpated distal to the medial epicondyle. And again, it's a short needle down into that ligament. Uh, similar for radial, I don't need to ask a question. Uh, radial collateral, the radial collateral ligament, the radial annular ligament will needle in the same location. So um, I, I group those two together, get that over there. For this, um, all right, so here again, here are, we're gonna be supine uh, with the arm on the abdomen. So previously the arm was uh, externally rotated. Uh, so we get to the medial aspect here. We want to get to that lateral aspect. So the arms on the abdomen, knee length here, maybe a little bit more, maybe up to two centimeters. Our backdrop is going to be onto the radial head. Uh, we're going to palpate down to the lateral supracondylar ridge uh, to the lateral epicondyle. We're going to drop even further distally to the junction of the capitulum and the radial head. We want to feel that joint space right there. We're going to needle from lateral to medial onto the posterior half of the radial head to hit the radial annular and the radial collateral ligament. Uh, here's a nice place to do some bidirectional rotation uh, or unidirectional with some tenting. Um, when you needle through radial collateral ligament, uh, you're also targeting uh, radial annular ligament. And same thing with the collateral. So let's jump back now to what that looks like. So I'm going to palpate down. I'm going to come off. I'm going to locate the space between the capitulum and the radial head. And I'm going to drop just a little bit onto that radial head. It's a very narrow window. I'm going to needle into that. There I get both of those um, ligaments at the same time. For lateral epicondyle, um, quite honestly, we're going to palpate down and we're going to locate uh, the distalmost aspect of that lateral epicondyle. We're going to needle onto it. Again, it's a short needle, uh, one and a half, two centimeters at most. And we're just going to do a little pecking around there to elicit uh, a change uh, in that, that tender spot there. And we find that needle down to it, peck onto that periosteum, and fairly superficial. And that was a 1.5 centimeter, and it, it didn't take much. As you can tell, the, the bony prominences are not the most exciting things, but they can be rather effective. Similar here, for the medial epicondyle, I'm just going to palpate for the distalmost aspect 
or the tender, most tender aspect. Could have been to take the needle. We're going to advance it. I was kind here. She had a little jump the last time. I didn't advance it here. Um, so medial epicondyle. All right. Then for the olecranon on bursa. Uh, so what we're going to end up doing is needling along the surface of the ulna right here. We're going to uh, insert the needle and then just thread it through uh, the skin. It's going to be fairly superficial. There's not a lot of uh, tissue there. If it's an inflamed bursa, obviously it will have more, uh, more bulk, um, more because of the inflammation there. So if you noticed earlier that the bursa has a has a piece uh, on the electrodon and it has a piece a little bit more proximally, uh, the, the the app shows them as two distinct bursa. In reality, there is a communication between them, so it's really more likely a single uh, bursa. Your location of your needling would be dependent upon your area of inflammation, your area of pain and swelling. So uh, it could be on the proximal aspect. Uh, more commonly, it will be right here. All right, I'm going to skip some of the, the chit chat about that. All right, so perineural protocols. We are at one and a half hours. We've got 30 minutes to get the remainder of this in. Uh, I'm going to show demonstrate less of this and just talk more about this uh, for the ulnar nerve, the radial nerve, uh, the remainder of these nerves. Ulnar, radial, musculocutaneous, maybe axillary. Some of these are very common that we treat very frequently. Others are less common. But again, like I frequently say, it's a nice piece to have in your back pocket in case you're just not getting the response that you're looking for. Uh, so we'll start with the ulnar nerve. Uh, with the ulnar nerve, uh, we'll, we'll be in the supine position, shoulders uh, abducted out to 30, forearm resting, supinated resting on a pillow. Again, so gain, gain access uh, to that, that, that medial aspect. Uh, here, we're going to target uh, adjacent to the ulnar nerve. We definitely don't want to needle directly into the nerve, uh, but being nearby uh, gives us the change that we're looking for. Our primary structures, number one, uh, we're going to hit obliquely between the medial epicondyle and the olecranon. And so here, that, that point shows to be right on that nerve, uh, but we're going to needle that in an, a very oblique, a very sharp angle. So we're not dropping down onto the nerve itself, but just through um, flexor carpi ulnaris here. So we just want to stimulate that muscle. Secondly, we're going to drop down. It doesn't show it here, but at the proximal wrist crease at the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris. So that's, that's what we're trying to elicit a change in. It's this muscle or the underlying ligaments that are providing the sensation uh, or that tightness, that compression on that nerve. So we've got these two uh, first here and then further at the wrist. Uh, our secondary, we're going to be three finger breaths uh, distally from the first point uh, between palmaris longus and flexor carpi ulnaris. So first one is we're going to drop down and then we're going to go another three finger breaths um, in, in that line towards um, in between palmaris longus and flexor carpi ulnaris. So we're really just following the ulnar nerve as it comes down and hitting the muscles as they, uh, or the tissues as they're getting near that. So we can provide a little bit more stimulation to that nerve. Uh, finally, if we so choose, we can go into um, uh, the muscles on the, that they innervate, flexor carpi ulnaris, the hypothenar group, and then the seven interossei. I would definitely wait on the seven interossei until I had tried the others and had not had significant success. Probably the most, uh, again, segmentally, we can also hit C8, T1. Um, definitely want to make sure we also hit medial epicondyle, medial acronon. But probably the most important one is going to be um, this oblique angle, uh, needle angle into flexor carpi ulnaris, being that that is our location of uh, most common nerve entrapment. That's definitely one that I might get into that. I might do some unidirectional rotation, do some tinting, and see if I can mobilize that tissue away from that nerve, free that up a little bit. Um, we have really good success with uh, perineural needling of the ulnar nerve. Okay, I've got a, a share of that. Let's take a look. 
You, all right. All right, so what that's gonna look like is, so we're gonna needle here. Again, it's gonna be an oblique angle. So that needle is gonna be, I uh, can't really do a three-dimensional. I'm pulling my mouse away and you can't see. Uh, but we're gonna stay superficial in the proximal aspect flexor carpi ulnaris. Again, I'm probably going to hit uh, lecranon uh, medial epicondyle as well, because that's going to be a site of an inflammation. I'm going to go ahead and drop down another three, three, finger, three finger breaths as well, uh, ends of flexor carpi uh, uh, ulnaris. Um, in between the two muscles, we described three finger breaths and another three finger breaths. I'm going to come down if I'm not getting the response that I'm looking for, and I can needle into the inner OCI, I would save that for very last. Um, definitely into the hypothene R eminence, just the, the muscles that are innervated by flexor carpi, uh, I mean, by uh, the ulnar nerve. And here's this distal most uh, flexor carpi ulnaris uh, right there. And starting spot, most definitely right here. I would hit the muscle itself. I'd hit the proximal aspect where you can feel it between uh, the two bones and then start traveling down the nerve itself. Okay. Uh, for the radial nerve, um, so actually had a, a student that came through that uh, had a weightlifting injury, uh, snapped his uh, proximal humerus and had a subsequent injury to his radial nerve, had, um, had wrist drop, had radial nerve palsy. Uh, we had, um, we didn't have as much time as I would like, but we did spend time and, and, and applied the uh, radial nerve approach uh, with some, some good results, started getting some return even before he finished his rotation. Uh, but you can expect that that could take a little bit of time. For the radial nerve uh, protocol, uh, primary locations is going to be at the intersection of brachialis and the brachioradialis uh, at the level of the lateral epicondyle. So we're going to start here, lateral epicondyle. We're going to come in between uh, brachialis, brachioradialis. We're going to come up another two finger breaths and then another three finger breaths along the, the path of that nerve. You can see it hidden, uh, buried inside those muscles there. Um, as we look at that, we're, we also want to hit the muscles that are associated, triceps, the other muscles innervated um, by the radial nerve. Um, uh, so uh, on our primary, again, at that location, then two finger breaths uh, proximal in that same direction. Very superficial, 1.5 centimeter is plenty. Secondarily, uh, we'll look two finger breaths distal from the first point between the bicep tendon and brachioradialis. So we're going to come on down um, into um, two finger breaths to here. And then we're going to do a, another needle, three finger breaths further distal um, towards the, oh, that's proximal. That's going to be this one up here. Um, so as we get into uh, the distal extremity locations, uh, we're going to get into the triceps. This further distal into the brachioradialis is gets that deeper uh location of the radial nerve as it's diving down underneath the muscle here. Uh, if we want to hit uh, the segmental location, uh, radial uh, nerve is C5 to T1. Uh, we can always stimulate there as well. So we'll take a look. Radial nerve. In those needle locations. So we just did ulnar on the lateral aspect. For radial, where we want to start is in this location between brachialis and brachioradialis, common entrapment location right there. Um, we're going to hit deep into uh, the brachioradialis uh, to get a little bit closer to the radial nerve as it sits deep to that. Uh, we want to get between uh, bicep and brachialis, bicep and brachioradialis uh, in, in that area there in the cubital crease. We then want to come catch tricep, but we also want to keep coming up that path of 
of the radial nerve as it, as it continues to come up. Uh, so very close to uh, where brachial radialis attaches. We want to catch it midpoint between our original spot here uh, across from the, the lateral epicondyle and then almost midpoint between lateral epicondyle and the deltoid tubercle. So just giving that muscle, that, that nerve, a lot of sensory input as it's heading back uh, towards uh, its um, supply. Uh, and we can always hit more of the muscle uh, that the radial nerve innervates. So for the posterior antibrachial cutaneous nerve, uh, so any of that uh, forearm um, altered sensation that we have um, on that on the on the lateral aspect, uh, as you can see, let's come around here. Um, our locations here are going to be at the midpoint between the deltoid tubercle and the lateral epicondyle between the lateral and medial head of the bicep of the tricep. So our next one will be between the lateral epicondyle and the olecranon, so right in there. And then four and eight finger rets distally from that point in a line towards the index finger. Um, so the antibrachial cutaneous nerve, just sensory in this, for this. And we're just, if we have some of that and it doesn't seem to be uh, a spinal in origin or segmental in origin, then we could look be looking at a, a, an entrapment somewhere along this line, more than likely where it comes out of between tricep and brachialis. Um, muscular locations, the medial lateral head of the tricep. Again, that's great location to hit there. Segmentally, we can hit C5 through eight. Uh, let's see here. There we go. Where's my library? Let's see if I can get here. There we go. So looking at this on the, the left upper extremity, you know, we're gonna see it having more to do with uh, uh, that dorsal surface. Uh, so one location, definitely between tricep and brachialis. Uh, it, it really seems to, to travel uh, between the heads of the tricep there. So uh, definitely getting that that, tri that that piece of the tricep. Uh, it can be done from posterior to anterior. Probably a better fit benefit is just going slightly posterior to the humerus into that tricep. Um, Want to come in and catch this piece off of the um, lateral epicondyle and then four and eight finger breaths further distally uh, down, as you can see there, on the extensor digitorum as it's traveling there. Okay, for musculocutaneous, uh, interesting um, here as musculocutaneous nerve actually pierces coracobrachialis. Um, so it, it can provide a common side of entrapment right there. A lot of people with anterior shoulder pain can have actually uh, impingement or compression of the musculocutaneous nerve there, um, creating problems further down. So that anterior shoulder pain can be uh, foretelling of, of a lot of, of issues. Um, so our primary locations, one thumb breath distal to the coracoid process. Want to be cautious. We have some neurovascular structures there, so we don't want to go too terribly deep. Uh, it says three to four centimeters. That's on a fairly large person. It does take it to get to that depth uh, to, to reach uh, the nerve, which is what we're looking to do here. I would caution not to go uh, beyond that to hit the, the vascular structures. Uh, we can also go anterior, posterior uh, to the humerus through the biceps, the level of the deltoid tuberosity. Um, that would give us our location right here. Uh, we then set a muscular, again, coracobrachialis, biceps brachii, and then come down and catch our brachialis. This is a case if we wanted, uh, since it's muscular, we could take biceps and brachialis just from an anterior to posterior location, just to hit both of them at the same time. 
segmentally, we could look at C5, C6, C7. Uh, those are the uh, levels that um, uh, make up uh, musculocutaneous nerve. So we will look. Library. Musculocutaneous nerve. All right, so again, I've removed the short head of the bicep so that you can see where the musculocutaneous nerve, it just simply pierces through coracobrachialis. So if you've got some anterior shoulder business going on, there's definitely gonna be more tension, uh, compression on that nerve. Uh, so we wanna hit the muscle. Uh, let's hit coraco uh, in both locations. Let's hit it up high, let's hit it down low, let's give it, give it its best chance to uh, eliminate uh, what's happening there. At a brain lapse, I thought I had a couple more locations to needle. I may have gotten bored. Uh, really, for muscular containers, that's our location. We need to release uh, coracobrachialis. Okay. And I really want to ask a Q&A here. Lateral endobrachial cutaneous nerve. So here, again, more of a superficial uh, sensory um, location. Primary location at the junction of the bicep brachii, the brachioradialis, the level of the bicep musculotendinous junction. So we're going to catch it right here. And then there in a line uh, from that point to the base of the thumb, we're going to put a needle, two finger breaths and four finger breaths, and then two finger breaths lateral from that and four finger breaths further distal parallel to that reference line. And then further distal um, between the radial artery and the tendon of flexor carpi radialis near the distal end of the radius. So we're just trying to flood this whole sensory distribution with uh, some stimulation to try to, uh, to provide some improvement there. Uh, odds are our, our location of uh, entrapment is gonna be a little bit more proximal. Um, if we want to, to do more, so as an extension of the musculocutaneous nerve, we definitely wanna come back and look at coracobrachialis, biceps brachii, brachialis because we may be having this issue out here, but our, our real issue may be further proximally dealing with the musculocutaneous nerve. Um, distal extremity, again, corico, definitely the coracoid process. Uh, we can also hit C5, C7. For the axillary nerve, um, so here, move that out of the way. Number one, we wanna look at the primary area of entrapment for the axillary nerve is in what's called the quadrilateral space. Uh, and there are four boundaries that create that. Uh, and it, it's a little harder to see it in this picture, um, but I'll, we'll look at it in a moment. So the medial uh, border is the lateral, medially it's the lateral border of the long head of the triceps. So here is our medial border. Uh, the lateral border is the medial cortex of the surgical neck of the, the humerus. Uh, the inferior border is superior border of the teres major muscle, and then um, inferior is the superior or superior is the inferior border of the teres minor. So this little square right here is this the quadrilateral space, and a fairly common location for compression uh, of that axillary nerve. Where, where we're really getting interested is in uh, its impact on, on sensation out in the lateral aspect of the deltoid. For this, um, we want to needle into that quadrilateral space. We just want to get into uh, the window there. Uh, then we're going to do two finger breaths uh, proximal to the deltoid tubercle. So here, and then we're going to come up another one finger breath and then a second finger breath superior to that point. Uh, definitely, let's hit deltoid. Let's hit Terry's minor and major. And then let's hit subscap as well because it's got a really close. So the anterior surface is subscap uh, and the posterior is Terry's minor. So we want to get all of that uh, to deal with the axillary nerve. Um, again, to go segmentally, we can look at C5, C6. Let's jump and take a look at that. Is that piece? Give me my library.
Okay. So again, looking at this quadrilateral space, we want to needle into that narrow window. Um, deltoid is in the way right here, but you can see uh, Terry's minor. Uh, you can or ter Terry's minor, Terry's major, uh, tricep, the humerus. Uh, we know that deltoid plays a role. Subscap uh, plays a role. So we want to just needle into that general location. Uh, when we're talking about the, the nerve uh, sensory innervation itself, let's definitely come out, again, a couple finger breaths above the deltoid tubercle, and then in one and another two finger breaths above just to get into that, uh, that nerve distribution. Uh, definitely hit, hit the delt, anterior post, and lateral, um, and then hit subscap, either from an anterior direction or from that posterior that we've talked about. All right, we'll come back. Medial brachial cutaneous nerve, uh, very short. Uh, I included it simply because it could be a component uh, for this. Um, we're going to be anterior to the brachial neurovascular bundle into the posterior biceps. Uh, so we're going to. So we're looking at the tricep here. We're going to needle anteriorly um, into the bicep, um, and then we're going to be caudal uh, to the pectoralis major. We can go C A T one there. Um, to make that look a little bit more medial brachial cutaneous. That. All right, so here. So kind of hard to see. We can come from a a lateral approach or more likely uh, right here. So it's right, it's just below pec minor, uh, pec major, if we were to take that out, if it will let me take it out, let me take it out. Then we see that the, the, the distribution there of that nerve, how often, uh, Compromised, probably not that often, but again, it's it's another one that I categorize in that better to have it in your um, back pocket just in case. That will be that that medial uh, upper arm uh, a sensory issue. If it's obvious it's not a uh, a segmental issue, then you need to lo look at potential nerve entrapment, and, and and that would be its location. So we come back the medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve. So very similar to what we just did uh, with um, the medial brachial cutaneous is here. Um, we're going to needle in the medial aspect of the short head, the biceps inferior to pectoralis. And we're going to do it two finger breaths distal and one finger breath anterior from that point. So just a little bit more of that, um, that medial uh, arm uh, altered sensation uh, from a perineural location. Nothing else is helping. We make a needle into that, provide some stimulation uh, to improve that. We're going to move further down the forearm now, looking at the anterior branch, the anterior branch of the medial antebrachial cutaneous nerve. Uh, we'll look at the anterior and then the posterior. Uh, for the anterior, the level of the biceps insertion into the pronator teres at the proximal, or again, proximal to the wrist crease towards the ulnar side of the flexor digitorum superficialis. And then two additional needles placed equidistant between those two points. So we're going to drop uh, here proximally, here distally, and then a nice straight line along that way. So this would be more of a, uh, a sensory on, the, on that anterior uh, aspect uh, of the forearm that we're, we're trying to uh, address there. Segmentally at C8, T1. And I'm going to look at both of these at the same time. Uh, for the posterior branch, Anterior was more midline, posterior is a little bit more on the medial aspect of the, uh, of the forearm. Uh, here, uh, the medial cubital crease, midpoint between the bicep tendon and the medial epicondyle. And so really, truly really dead smack into pronator teres there. And then we're gonna do in the middle forearm in the uh, FCR, FCU, and the ECU. Again, 1.5 centimeters uh, if we wanna hit segmentally. C A T one. So let's look at those quickly, and then move on to our protocols. Get our library. 
Where are we? This is where we are. Yes. So for so here is for posterior, uh, which is if I can highlight that. If it will allow me, kill that. Okay, so there's the posterior branch, medial anabrachial cutaneous nerve. So more more of that midline, uh, medial side of the of the of the forearm, anterior forearm, any of that sensory issue. Again, if we know that we're not having a significant compression anywhere else, uh, and we have addressed it up higher, uh, then we could deal with it. Again, we're going to hit uh, pronator teres and then follow across the three muscles out here just to provide some stimulation coming back uh, with the anterior branch. Yeah, we caught that. Our needle location was, and skin's not in there, so we can't really see. We're going to drop uh, anterior to posterior between bicep tendon and the medial epicondyle, and we're going to drop another needle further distally right here, and then a couple more midpoint in between. So just following the, the, the sensory path of that nerve as it moves further uh, down. All right. All right, now our regional diagnosis protocols, bicipital tendonitis, we, we, we talked about that a lot with the advanced shoulder uh, three weeks ago, uh, but we'll review that again. Um, for that, uh, if we're dealing with it proximally, we want a needle into, let me get to that next slide, the bicipital tendons. Uh, this is for the proximal. Um, uh, both the short head and the long head, we wanna make sure we needle there. Secondarily, we're gonna to try to isolate the short and long head of the bicep itself. So both in the tendons, and then we wanna hit the, the, the individual heads. We wanna then hit the muscle belly itself. Somewhere along this path, we're gonna get the response that we're looking for. Again, most of our tendonitis, tendinosis issues are related to uh, neuromuscular tension in whichever structure is attached to that tendon. Eliminate the source of the neuromuscular tension and eliminate that force, and you decrease the load on that tendon. Um, segmentally, if we want, we can hit it at C5, C6. Uh, usually out in this area is uh, the easier way. Most common long head and intertubercular groove is where we're going to be addressing. If we want to throw the musculocutaneous nerve perineural protocol, we can hit that right in there. Uh, that can definitely uh, play a little bit of a role uh, with that bicep. Uh, again, musculocutaneous nerve uh, pierces through coracobrachialis as it moves uh, between coracobrachialis and short head of the bicep uh, moving distally. For the insertional piece, a uh, very similar. First thing we want to do is the bicipital insertion tendon. Uh, if that's the location of our uh, complaint, let's needle that. Uh, second, we'll hit the, uh, the muscle belly itself, see if we can get a larger uh, decrease in that neuromuscular tension. And then lastly, the short and the long heads themselves. Occasionally, we'll see a case of uh, bicipital uh, tendonitis, tendinosis, both in the origin and in the insertion. It's more rare. Tend typically, it's going to be one or the other. Uh, again, if we wanted to uh, hit C5, C6, and we can also use the musculotendinous um, protocol for dealing with, with that component as well. Uh, we've looked at that on uh, complete anatomy before. I think we're good there. For tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis, one of the more common things that we see with the upper extremities uh, here for our needling, number one, we want to needle directly onto the lateral epicondyle. Uh, then we want to needle into the common extensor and the tenoosseous junction. Uh, so we want to just get a nice spot in here. Finally, uh, if we're not getting what we want there, then we want to go into the individual muscles, brachioradialis, extensor carboradialis longus brevis, then into extensor digitorum. A uh, couple of visits, we don't seem to be getting the change that we're looking for. Then we're add, we'll add extensor carpi ulnaris and enconius. Uh, more than likely, you know, what I don't have in here, always, first, in addition to common extensor, is the common extensor group. So very first, let's needle through all of this first. Um, second, second part of this primary, then we jump onto the lateral epicondyle and common extensor uh, tenoosseous junction. 
So that common piece first. Uh, we could hit five, six, seven, eight, and we could hit radial nerve as well as a peri-epineural location. For tennis elbow, let's do take a look there. All right, library. All right, so for tennis elbow, again, number one, we're gonna to come to the anterior aspect. We came and we, we, we drew this V-notch in the introductory lab. It's easier, we, we, get a, we get a decent chance at reducing all of this uh, muscular tendinous, a neuromuscular tension in the muscle. If it is just a muscular piece, needle through all of that. And usually we can knock that out. If it's persistent, if there's a grade, a high grade one, grade two uh, strain, uh, then we may need to look at these other things. First, uh, we'll hit um, the common uh, extensor tendon, hit the uh, lateral epicondyle. And then if that doesn't do it, then we'll start moving along each of the, the muscles that form that common tendon. So we isolate each one, uh, even if we don't get the res desired result after step one, step two. So um, with that, we also have to make sure that we throw in our, our manual therapy, our flexibility, our stretching program, and then ultimately getting back to our strengthening of all of these common extensors. So uh, one of the failures frequently with uh, tennis elbow is just having a person extend. Well, if we don't extend and radially deviate and, and, and ulnarly deviate, then we're missing a full half of what those structures, what those muscles are doing. So uh, one of the nice things that I like about dry needling is it pulls that piece of information together so that we know which muscle is really giving us our problem. So for keeping our eyes open, uh, we know that maybe it's uh, extensor carpi ulnaris, or maybe it's uh, extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis. It tells us where we need to focus our, uh, our treatment. Okay, still not doing Q&A. All right, not opposed to Q&A, it's just the wrong button. Golfer's elbow, very similar, very similar approach. We're just gonna move it further uh, to the medial side. Our primary location, again, we're gonna hit that common flexor group we're going to hit that first. Uh, if that doesn't get there, then we want to come out. We want to hit the medial epicondyle, the tenoosseous junction, and the uh, there we can do it again periosteal uh, pecking with some unidirectional rotation, and then again that common flexor group from the original um, introductory material. Secondarily, we're not getting what we want. We're going to hit pronator teres, flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, flexor carpi ulnaris, and flexor digitorum superficialis. So again, that's gonna give us our idea of which muscles are really giving us uh, this, this pain, this problem for this patient. And that's gonna let us target those uh, either with the dry needling or with our, our exercise program after the fact. Lastly, we'll come down and hit pronator quadratus um, and then segmentally C5 through T1. Uh, from a periapineural standpoint, we can hit median and ulnar nerve here. And so let's take a look at that. Get my library back up. And we're getting really close. We're almost there. Yeah, and what that looks like here, very first thing, we're going to come through pronator teres. We're going to go lateral, get that common flexor group, just thread through everything. We don't get what we're looking for there. We're going to hit on to the, the medial epicondyle and that common flexor tendon, tenoosseous junction. Still not the response. Then we're going to individually go down each of these muscles as we go through each and every one of them, uh, ending in extensor carpi or um, flexor carpi ulnaris. Uh, so uh, as we go through those, uh, we can lastly drop down to pronator quadratus. Probably not ever going to be necessary for a golfer's elbow to a pronator quadratus, but it, it is part of the movement chain and it could have a role. And then finally, cubital tunnel. So here, very similar to the ulnar nerve, ulnar nerve protocol, um, we definitely want to hit um, the two heads, flexor carpi ulnaris. Um, we want to catch 
either side, just off of uh, the olecranon uh, and off of the uh, medial uh, epicondyle. We also want to come into uh, the cubital, retina, cubital tunnel retinacular. Uh, this picture doesn't show it as well as some other pictures do, uh, but the nerve does dive behind that. Uh, and so needling into that can help relieve um, some of that, that tension in, in that ligament. Um, talking to different surgeons, uh, it's that release of the Osborne's ligament or the cubital tunnel retinaculum that is really what their goal is with, um, with that cubital tunnel release. And if we can get in there and use a little unidirectional rotation, do some tinting and release that, that ligament, uh, then we may be able to provide that, 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 that improvement that they're looking for without that, that three-inch scar that we're so common to see uh, with uh, an ulnar um, a cubital tunnel release. Secondarily, we can come in, we can hit that medial epicondyle, we can hit the olecranon, we can come down further and just, just target flexor carpi ulnaris uh, to get uh, a, a, an improvement in function uh, out of that muscle, release of inflammation. Segmentally, we can come up and hit C8, T1. And then we can always just do the very similar ulnar nerve protocol, which is very similar to what we've already done here. Biggest difference in the nerve protocol in cubital tunnel is in Osborne's ligament. Uh, and doing that needling to mobilize that tissue. Um, so one more look here. So I've included uh, the, the nerve here. So definitely we want to get into these um, in the Osborne's ligament, uh, both above and a little below. We definitely want to be cautious. We don't want to pierce directly into the ulnar nerve, uh, but it's easily palpable. Um, uh, I get asked if we if we need to do um, ultrasound guided. Um, I've done ultrasound guided. I, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think research that I've looked at has shown that we have better outcomes or more adverse events if we do uh, based on palpation verse, versus using ultrasound guidance. Um, but definitely we need to make sure that we uh, mobilize both above and at the ligament itself. Um, again, we're going to come into um, uh, flexor carpi ulnaris, proximally and just a little further distally, and then at the olecranon and on um, the medial epicondyle as well. Ah, and we've survived. Hot dog, you, you put up with us for, for another episode of some technology uh, uh, issues. Hopefully this will work out a little bit better and we'll get smarter as we do this a little bit more. So that's the end of the advanced elbow. Um, your post-lecture assignment, again, not terribly difficult. There's no video involved, video involved this time. Uh, number one, identify four muscles and structures or structures that should be assessed and considered for treatment for medial elbow pain. Number two, what named nerve and spinal levels is responsible for A, elbow flexion, and B, elbow extension? And then finally, number three, explain how to test, differentiate, and identify extensor carpi radialis, ex extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor digitorum, and extensor carpi ulnaris. And on that, I'm looking at what do you do with the fingers? What do you resist? What are you testing uh, to, to let us know? what we're gonna to try to find there. So that's post-lecture assignment. Our next lecture is gonna be on August the 16th. Uh, we will have a, a lab, another lab one um, between now and then in Indiana. Uh, looking forward to, uh, to going up there and teaching uh, those fine clinicians. Uh, so we will see everybody back on August 16th where we will get into advanced dry kneeling of the wrist and hand. As you see, as we get into the elbow, as we get now even into the hand, our, our structures get smaller, our, our tolerances get more narrow, and so our palpation uh, gets more um, uh, important as we, as we move into that. So if you have questions, if you have issues, uh, feel free, shoot me a message, let me know what's going on. Uh, don't forget to get that homework done. I will have this recording uploaded and on the student portal probably sometime tomorrow. Uh, so if you have anything else, feel free to reach out, let me know. Otherwise, 
Um, enjoy, have fun looking at this, and we will see you again in three weeks.